Dr. Lisa here for another episode of Owning Her Health. I have the beautiful Leslie Urbas on coming to you from Spain and her work as a concierge, a concierge health coach, which takes it up a notch. She's not only helping you in a normal health coaching way, which for those of you who might not understand the difference between that and a traditional, let's say, uh, nutritionist is that they're looking at more likely looking at your holistic their their holistic needs they're more likely looking at your lifestyle your um total wellness in general which is going to get into things such as what leslie's specialty is is looking at the energetics of food and her methodology which we get into but i want to um say that her particular story she's very well educated as many of us are, especially as we hit our stride in our careers, in our late 30s, into our 40s. Uh, but even even with that, one, one of the discussions that is important and why I hold these Owning Her Health discussions is because we just get into the conversation like two women do about just how how hard it is as parents working in a world where, where things are so fast and there's so much information coming out every day. It's hard, hard hard to hard to know where to go because Leslie and I were talking and I don't remember if it was in the pre-recording or the post-recording that's going to go into my private podcast subscribers or if it's in this show but um we get into discussion about as much as we know sometimes you know where the science is lacking because maybe you know the traditional healthcare system for example is not using all the functional medicine that uh you may learn if you're if you're looking at more of the modern medicine if you're not necessarily in the western model and you're bringing in things more that the naturopaths and the osteopaths and 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 chinese medicine and and ayurvedic medicine things things like that cultures that valued the whole well-being right people think about those centurions in the blue zones and understanding how important lifestyle is and and really comes down to our energetics and so i'm, I'm really excited to bring this conversation of leslie and i she's uh out of the university of miami she went into the military so she was able to really you know one of the things people don't realize at least in the american military is you get access to a lot of training and education you're working hands-on with people obviously that are, are dealing with a lot of things but there's also that structure that when you are visionary like so many of us that are listen to this podcast and, and are doing the work in entrepreneurship so many women especially go into entrepreneurships because we are big supporters already we're big hearts we understand we see the vision enough and we're so well educated now that we we see the gaps we see the gaps in leadership we see the gaps in relationships we see the gaps in enterprise and uh that can be it can be getting really difficult to know where you can even work. I almost feel like entrepreneurship to bring education and information like this is a necessity or else you're just, you're just never going to be a good employee. You're never going to be in a good employee someplace where you're being forced to do things in a way that you personally feel is wrong. It's, it's not in your moral code. So I'm not saying everybody should, you know, Get themselves out of the hospitals or the schools or this or that. I'm just saying, understand that if you're taxed, if you're tired, if you're seeing your Gen Zs exhausted, it's because they they're smart. They know what they're up against, and we're just going to have to, you know, do the Kirby hustle, create the Kirby hustle ecosystem, develop this alternative, like Book Mister Fuller said. You know, create. Don't don't waste time pushing on the oppressors. Don't waste time trying to educate the ignorant who just don't, you know, the people, it's working. It's working for the system, the system elites right now, the people in charge of our food, the people in charge of our our well-being, supposedly, our health care, the people in charge of the academia. It's working for them. It's working the way it is, but it's not working for most of the people. And it's time, especially the mothers or the leaders of much of the enterprise and the relationships and core leadership, core values, core drivers in the home. Not to say that the their partners, domestic partners, are not involved, but we all understand that um, when you're literally looking at someone's nutrition through your own nutrition, in fact, that as the belly guru in my um, first company was how I got so many overachieving, high achieving 
uh, professional women to start really taking care of themselves and working on their energetic cycles, which are different than men's cycles, was when they were pregnant or trying to get pregnant. That's why I, I focused on pregnancy year, because I understood so many of us are, again, when we're young, we don't think we haven't seen the world enough. We don't understand how much ownership and power we have. We get so exhausted through motherhood or just, you know, forcing through our career. And by the time we hit menopause, things can be a disaster. So if you're suffering right now through menopause changes, uh, weight gain that you can't get rid of or finding your body image is really getting challenged. This is for you. If you are a young Gen Z and you're, and you're in the midst of that sort of, I hate my body, you know, oh gosh, I think of myself back in my twenties and in my teens and I was fairly active, but I, you know, I, I just remember that, you know, I remember the people that were having eating disorders and, and the challenges and all of that. I, 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 oh, I so feel for you. This is for you. If you're a mother and you're struggling with yourself and making sure that you're staying healthy, not only from the food you're putting in, but all the nourishment that comes into you as well as what you're putting out. That's a part we get into that, that I don't think, I think we got into this for the open podcast. If not, it's in the, it's going to be in the private podcast for those of you who subscribe to the Curvy Hustler. I'll put that subscription um, information in the, the uh, shop notes, uh, the show notes for um, the Owning Her Health uh, podcast on my lips and Owning Her Health podcast on my lips and so when you see this direct direct link to go to the show page make sure you go on there so that you can hear all the other little conversations that i may put from these episodes onto that uh curvy hustler uh newsletter community all right guys so we will get going with the show i want to make sure that if you have any questions please do catch us on social media at Dr. Lisa Holland PT. That's me over on Instagram uh, at Goddess Wisdom over on TikTok and on my YouTube as well at Dr. Lisa Holland PT. You could just Google me up and you'll find me. Have a conversation with me. Send an email direct to support at Dr. Lisa Holland PT.com. If you'd like to give me an idea for the show, totally open to that. Welcome to this episode of Owning Her Health with your host, Dr. Lisa Holland, PT. Join Lisa as she starts the conversation on what it really takes to become a healthy, wealthy, and whole CEO of your life. Listen in to real talk by real lady leaders in all walks of life as they open up on personal health stories, wealth, career, and feminine abundant living. Learn how to grow by owning your body, expanding your mind, and aligning your soul with the purpose only you can pursue in this world. Happiness begins with owning her health right now. Welcome back, everyone, to another wonderful episode of Owning Her Health. Thank you so much for being here. As you heard in the introduction, I have the lovely Leslie Urbus. She's she is coming from Spain. She has a story. She's former uh, military with the, with the Navy. She had her uh, awareness of where she needed to really get back into her body and her mind, and made a beautiful you know made, sparking a beautiful business idea or calling from that. And uh, Especially if you're looking to connect in this collaborative mind we talk about with the Her Herbie Hustle, where there's, yeah, comp competition in yourself getting better as a conscious leader, but then, you know, really realizing this right now, we're not going to get connection in the world and, 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 and better food and better environment if we're, if we're all independent operators on a lone wolf mission to destroy ourselves. So I think uh, Leslie's story of, of who she became and, and what she's becoming and what her vision is, is very relevant to our conversation here on owning her health. So thank you so much, Leslie, for being here. Um, this took us, oh my God, we were like talking in like, what was it, June? I don't know. <laughs> it took us a couple months to kind of actually sit here. I always say with powerful women, when I when that happens, that it's divine timing to some extent, and also that the enemy is strong. So this is going to be a great conversation. Thank you, Leslie, for being here. Tell us a little bit from your view how did you get from, okay, I'm growing up, I'm going into the military, I'm doing that whole thing, to now I'm in Spain with my family and I'm, you know, doing some health coaching, particularly around, you know, the reclamation, I feel like, of food and body image and getting off this idea of, of, of manipulating it so much. How did you get from there to here 
How many years was that? Was it a fast process? And, and tell us a little bit about how that, because part of it was owning your health. And um, I know that's, so, that's always a story for the women that I have on here. That's not so simple as, oh, I have an idea. Let's go with it. <laughs> yeah, so true. So true. So let's, I guess let's start with, you know, I never, when I was little, I never had that like body image, body worry kind of thing. I remember the first time I ever learned that weight was a thing. Mm -hmm. I was 14 on the playground in my grade school. And the two popular girls were like, what do you weigh? And oh my gosh. I'm like, what? And they're like, what do you weigh? And I was like, I don't, I, 135. And they're like, oh yeah, we knew you weighed more than us. And I just remember being like, what is that? I don't know what that is. Like, I don't understand that, right? It wasn't something that resonated with me. So I do explain that because some people grow up from a very early age with weight things. For me, it was the first time weight became a thing in my mind. Well, fast forward to like four months later when I entered high school, my high school softball coach uh, on my first week of high school told me that while I was a great softball player, I was never going to play varsity because I was too fat. At that moment, I will tell you, I was of right height with the right body weight. My BMI was perfectly in the middle for my height. Okay. So I was not fat. I just wasn't super skinny like the right. other people. Like that it's called me. athletic. It's called mesomorph. For those of you yeah. that are in the, I know I have a lot of health providers. Like we understand like, yeah. you're, you were made actually to be really good on that team. Yeah. So. <laughs> That really crumbles me because I came from a long line of people that loved softball, baseball, all that good stuff. And then shortly after that, maybe four days, I sat in my high school class. We have six classes. No, I think we had eight classes and you went to six a day. And I sat by a girl in like four or five of them in alphabetical order. We sat by each other in most classes. We laughed. We had a good time. And I was like, hey, you want to hang out this weekend? She was like, oh, Leslie, you're really sweet. But, you know. You're too fat to hang out with us. Oh my sorry. gosh. And so thus began my weight cycle. And in high school, I did what everybody typically does. It was, you know, I'm trying Weight Watchers. I'm calorie counting. I am portion controlling. I am, my mom and I were doing it together. She was always very supportive of me. She, um, we did Adkins. I bet then like right after Adkins came like the really super high protein kind of things. And I remember at 16 years old, I told my mom I was going to start waking up at 5 a.m. to walk, and she woke up with me. And I'm not kidding. I still wake up every morning to work out, but that began my, I am going to do these things, and I'm going to do them well, and I'm never going to give up. Uh, I would schedule at a point in my high school being able to work out in the morning and take a run in the evening because I felt so awful. But no matter what I did, all those diets never ate in the lunch line. I remember the day I had to eat in the lunch line because I forgot my lunch. I bawled my eyes out thinking I had to eat the lunch food and that I was not in control. And I was 25 pounds heavier when I walked out of my high school. So it wasn't something where diets really worked for me because diets really don't work and you'll get right. there with my story. But yeah. And when I, when I went to go to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to go far from home. And my sister had actually looked at one of the schools that was close to us uh, at our home. And she was going to be a dietitian. I was like, Ooh, what is that? And then I learned it's all about nutrition, health, and food. And I was like, great, my obsession. I get to just go do that. Right. Wow, I can so, get a degree in that? <laughs> yeah. So I went and I, I was like, I'm going to be a dietitian. And I'm one of those people that like, if I put my mind to it, I don't quit. Like, even if I get a sign somewhere in there that I could go a different direction, there was a piece in, in college where you learned a lot about food science and how science makes food and it's amazing. And I loved it. And I considered for just a minute, but then I realized I'd be in a lab instead of with people and I'm much better with people. So I knew not to, but it was very interesting. And I went through college. I lost my weight initially when I got into college because I, I just went if I am going to be a dietitian, I need to walk the walk and be healthy. And it wasn't that I was really overweight at that point. I mean, maybe my BMI was like a 26, 27. So I wasn't fat that, but I wasn't, I wasn't healthy for my size. I knew it. I didn't feel good. So I did what everybody does. And I was in college. Nobody was paying attention. I just didn't really eat. Right. I went through a six to seven week period where I 
was basically anorexic. I mean, I remember eating like a saltine cracker, a diet right, and the green foods at dinner. And that's basically what I ate for six weeks while working out twice a day. If I felt really awful, I would give myself like a half of a protein bar because I I just knew that I needed to, you know, at least function. And in six to seven weeks, I lost all my weight. My cousin who worked with me at the time kind of processed what was happening. I denied to my mom and I knew at that moment I had to change because I wasn't going to any sort of rehab or anything like that. So I just immediately changed. To this day, I have no idea how I did it for six or seven weeks. No clue. I, like I couldn't do it again if I tried anything right. like that. It's just like a, it was a hot minute. So I know what people go through and I understand why it can overtake you. However, I got to the way I wanted to and I stayed there for a little bit. But then, you know, you you start drinking, you enjoy your time in college, you do other things. And I became the yo-yo dieter. I enjoyed oh, yeah. diet. If I was on the diet, I was skinny. Just like all my clients say, I know what to do. I'm just not doing it. Right. Just like a lot of the people that like resonate with some of the things I say is that I know how to lose the weight. It's that the moment I stop, I gain it all back. And that right. was me throughout my entire twenties. I was great at it. If the boyfriend and I were doing great, great. I was doing great. You know, if we were having, you know, some bad times, then maybe we were drinking too much and eating too much awful food. It was bad. Right. So I was all over the map in my twenties and I was in the military, like you had said, you know, when I was in my internship, I just got this little email. Are you interested in joining the Navy as a dietitian? And I was like, yes, that's me. Very similar to how I became a dietitian. Oh, I'm going to go do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to follow. <laughs> and, you know, I can't ignore that when I was in college, my, I, I always imagined myself being an entrepreneur and not working for somebody. But I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't raised to do things on your own. That wasn't safe. That wasn't something I should do. So when I saw the military path, I was like, great, they'll give me the experience. So then I can just go do whatever I wanted to do. But being in the military as a dietitian, I processed just how messed up health is. You know, like our government should be supporting the people that are fighting for us. And they just aren't. Like I was confined by so many rules and I was stuck in so many different things that I was like, I can't even really help this person, nor do some of them actually want to be helped. Like I right. can't deny it as well, you know, you know, the military love it, but you, you do get a lot of rules. Like you can't wear your hair a certain way. You can't do things with your nails. You know, you have to work out, you have to do these things, you know, um, and you live and die by the rules. So if you don't really want to follow the rules or the Navy or any sort of military or government like jade you in a way, you're just like a kid rebelling against it. Right. So I had lots of people come to my office like doctor made me come. So I'm here. Right. Okay, you want to talk? No, I just want to go. OK, build your requirement on my end. I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about nothing. Right. So. I felt so unfulfilled, you know, I'm serving in the military. I wanted to be deployed. Mm -hmm. The moment I got out as a reservist, they wanted to send me everywhere. I was like, well, now I have a kid and I don't want to go anywhere. Right. I don't want to do this anymore. I wanted to do it for eight whole years and you wouldn't send me anywhere. And now I have a baby and you're like, we are going to send you to some rural area overseas for two weeks to do this thing. And then we'll send you back. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to, you know, you missed your window. Uh, and I think that was a good thing because I, maybe I would have stayed in longer, but I saw, so I, I, in my career, I started as a military dietitian and then I went and I was a reservist and I actually went back and did the exact same job I did in the military, but as a civilian and Doing that, there was just so many things, you know, I'd see that woman that was the spouse come in, just broken because she needed to lose weight. Her husband didn't have to because he was super skinny. He got deployed a lot. He always wanted fast food when he came home. One of their kids is obese and the other one has food allergies. And she's like, how do I do this? How do I do this and not make 17 meals? And I'm like, I can't help you. I can only help you because the consult's for you. I can't address that kid's health issues or that one or your husband. I am not allowed to by law. And I'd like to say the main reason I got out was for that, but it was really for my own family. 
And in knowing that this calling behind my brain was just there. As time went on and I hit my 30s, I stopped dieting and really learned the four pillars that I teach to people of how to fully accept yourself and love yourself and re release the shame and guilt and release the vicious cycling of diet is actually what you need to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And I started to see that as I became more clear with myself, the weight fell off just as easy as you undo your bra. And I, I mean, it's so simple. Right. Yeah. But I, I I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to kind of point out a couple of really important things that, you know, for anybody listening, for them to sort of catch here. We're talking about a whole systemic sort of thing, right? It was a matter of control, culture, community, right? Conversations and conversations that are actually productive, right? That there's actually, you know, people commute, like, I can't communicate with this person. Well, there needs to, they need to be receptive. Like you said, you also need to know how their language, right? I, I often feel I actually, I teach something called TAPS, which is targeted axiological profiles, because it's like, we need to know the psychographics of the person. That's not just for marketing. Like we need to kind of understand who, what their core values and their beliefs are so that we are good enough as coaches, guides, consultants, trainers, therapists, health providers, whoever to meet them. But like you said, we also need to make sure we understand. And it's hard when you have to be assigned. Like I always found that hard as a clinician, right? Like you, you kind of feel like you have to take care of them. Like you can't discharge them unless they're showing non-compliance. That was the way to get out, right? Non-compliance with, with whatever. Um, but, but sometimes it's not a match. So there's just so many nuggets I just wanted to point out there for people understanding like the complexity of, of, you know, this is, this is why we need social healers. This is why we can't just keep the dietitians in the hospital systems or in the clinics or whatever. It literally, they need to be advocates talking to the food industry. This is why we need the government involved. This is everything you were saying about the military and all that institution on life institution was healthcare for me. Same exact thing. I couldn't get on the maternity floor because that was nurses education. And I'm like, then educate on the pelvic floor and stop just educating postpartum on just breastfeeding, like realizing how many pieces are here. And so whoever's listening to this, you're a piece of this. You're a medicine woman coming out of law, maybe, because some of these laws and rules need to change. You're a medicine woman coming out. It's not just out of healthcare now. And those of you who are in the home trying to balance this all, whether you had a career or not, your career was going to be family or whatever, you're traveling around with your spouse for their career. Like, you know, you, you had, we need to start finding places where we're all connecting here and can start working together because it's going to, it's going to take a village. You're one of those people sort of building a village with some of your, you know, the seat, the seat, the, the energy of food, because it is, it's us coming together and creating a force. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think one of the biggest keys, which you just kind of brought up, I was listening to a podcast today that was really broadcasted to me from other moms. I listened to the first five minutes and when I was like, I am not a typical mom. This doesn't resonate. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was like, this, this is awful. Like, why do I want to, like, I could just feel the energy from it. Like, I feel small. I feel yeah. angry. Like that victim, right? Like we're going to hang out yeah. in victim mode. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, and I'm good with that podcast. I guess I'm going to have to figure out something else to listen to on my two hours that I walk by myself every day. So, so yeah, so I hit my thirties and, uh, I guess that's really when I started dating my husband as well. And just kind of process like, this is not a life worth living things that, you know, I was still working at the Naval hospital, still doing that. I was like, this is just not, I'm not teaching anything, but I, by law, I still wasn't able to teach the things that I was doing to myself. And I really resonate with, with four things. And that is the first thing is uh, cater to you nutrition and note right now, everything out there is like, just like how you were saying, you were like, we need to band together to, you know, talk about like where we're getting our foods, the ingredients and in food, stuff like that. That's what I mean by catered to you nutrition. See, people get these like you know, they get these tests done and they're like, oh, I'm allergic to this. So you avoid it. 
but you might not actually be allergic to those foods. They may have a sensitivity to you, sure, but maybe it's not all the foods. Maybe it's where the food was grown. Um, I had a lot of people in COVID that when they would see me, they would have supplements, right? And then all of a sudden they, they would be like having adverse side effects because the supplement companies and people like that couldn't get the same access because of our limitations from who could get what. So products changed, but they didn't have to tell you that the third ingredient is no longer right. coming from the place, right? You're just experiencing new symptoms, which is why a lot of people started to get more GI upset and things like that. And so I really hope people understand that the nutrition needs to be catered to you. You know, I have a lot of people that I like can share the same story of they cannot eat bread in the United States, but when they come oh, yeah, to that's your- I've heard that a lot. Yeah. Heard because of the lot. GMOs and the other- Like the but pasta come- and the whatever, and they're totally like gluten-free or whatever. And then they go to Italy and they're like, I was eating the pasta, the bread, the wine, everything. I was fine. Yeah. And it's so common, right? So that's what I mean, catered to you nutrition. It's not just, and that's the biggest thing that I think the wellness industry is doing awfully. They're like, we're giving you your roadmap or your whatever, like some of the bigger diet places, like we're catering to you. No, you're plugging and chugging numbers. And right. people aren't, it always reminds me of like the, uh, it's a, it's a, how I met your mother episode where like Ted goes in and he's like trying to find his perfect bride. And it's like a combination. And she's like, I'm really sorry. There's no matches for you. Like right. there's no, match. you know, the funny story of that. I don't know if you know the story of wonder woman, the character wonder woman and who, who the, 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 the uh, Dr. Marston is who, uh, wrote wonder woman and, and developed that character. He's also the guy who made the, um, the truth, the lie detector test. Oh yeah. And yeah. he also lived with two women who were the combination were wonder woman. One was very traditional and whatever they were like lived in as, as a threesome and the, you know, total career woman on the other side with whatever. And they kind of did all their studies and stuff that he then sort of, that's why you have the lasso of truth with Wonder Woman and all this other stuff. So it's so interesting that, because it's like, that is the problem, right? Like these people, like we want this yeah. like ultimate woman. <laughs> and it's just, it's 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 not there. We're, there's no right. perfect whatever. And therefore, same thing, right? Like there's no perfect diet. There's no whatever that we can mass market. Let's all just agree with this. And And I get it. Like, that's great when you find your methodology and your process. But like you said, this is who you are. This is, I never understood. Well, I did understand once you realized the, the business of it, but like, right? We used to all be told, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. You are what you eat, right? You are. Now all of a sudden we don't get told that. It's like, they don't want to tell you that because then you're going to be like, that means I'm chemicals. That means I'm highly processed. That means I'm, <laughs> and we are. Ooh, that's true. You know, like, that's a good way to put it. I mean, yeah. So I ideally really help you understand that, yes, you technically are really who, what you eat. And as long as you're eating the things that are in conjunction with your body, you're good. Now, that doesn't mean you might not eat something full of chemicals. Like I can't right. tell you, I don't. Right. But if chemicals. you can process it, because what I'm hearing from you is we need to get back to like a functional, you know, that's why I loved and kind of went towards yoga because the Ayurvedic system that, that used yoga was a medical system you know, yeah. I loved Chinese medicine. I loved reading about that. I loved read about the hermetics because they actually talked about spiritual, you know, like I, I loved looking at all these like ancient, ancient medicines that are still in use, guys, like allopathic medicine never really made sense when you really look at the history of it. I mean, it made sense, but it also was a business. It came in as a business, the heads of right. petroleum, the heads of corporations, all the monopoly board people are the ones that were on the boards of, of hospitals and kicked everybody out because food should have been part of that. Like I, you know, like mm. it's hard to like, why was not, why was nutrition? Like you have the dietitian, but why was it not nutritionists who were in there? the biggest thing that I think like your work could really help is so many people now that we understand, which we should have really understood already because the yogis were telling us for thousands of years that the gut speaks to the brain and the mindset and your whole, you know, so many people I think could probably use a wonderful person like you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that help with that as well. Um, but agreed to that. And so I actually, Oh, throw my husband under the bus again. I swear he never listens to any of my podcasts or he'd be like, 
<laughs> he's gonna listen to this one because he's gonna need he's to hear it. <laughs> uh, and it's not in a bad way but my our son is a lot different of an eater than our daughter. Mm. Our daughter will basically eat whatever we give her and she loves everything. There's occasionally days where she doesn't eat that much, but if she doesn't eat that much, she's not asking me for a bunch of snacks or something later. It's really because she's not hungry. And I pride myself on, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old who still eat in conjunction with themselves. And Mm. you'll see them ask for broccoli just as often as they ask for candy. And I don't have a problem with that because the more I praise one thing or another, the more likely they're that, like don't make but, food the villain. Correct. Right? So so part of the process that I teach is something called the secret energy of food and detoxing your kitchen. And my kids have that. Um, I actually learned a little bit about their human designs and found out that my son prefers cold food. And I was like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. You give my kid anything frozen, he will try to eat it frozen. Even if you're like, it really needs my to niece be and my niece does that. She's like, can yeah. I have like, like, like right out of the refrigerator to the freezer, like green beans, like, and she'll, yeah. I get it. He will eat. I mean, and, and he, if you give him, if you give him the pint of blueberries, they are gone. He does not stop. He just goes, but I mean, fruit is his like favorite food in the world. And I don't have a problem with that, but, but there mm. are other where he, We've, we've both noticed, like, you know, my husband's been worried, like he's not getting enough protein, he's not getting enough protein. I was like, this is the world telling you your kid needs more protein. Your kid, three years and younger, needs no more than basically these two fingers of food, right? Your pinky and your ring finger of protein. That's really it. They don't need much more than that. Like we think they need these massive amounts of protein because we're eating like double the palms of our hands at a meal. We don't even need that much protein. But we're, we're so conditioned to that, that we think that the small portions we're giving our kids aren't good. And I finally kind of trained him on it and trained him out of it. Like he's understanding. And my son is so good at telling food that he can tell if he doesn't want to eat it. And when my husband sometimes is in a bad mood and cooking, AKA secret energy of food, detoxing your kitchen, he won't eat certain things that he's cooked because he's intuitively knowing I don't yes. want them. Yes. And so something that people are missing, and another reason why I think that people can eat more of the pastas and stuff in Italy is because those people love their food. Energetics. Yes. Like we have to think about, and so much of the stuff, right? It's it's cooked in water and we have science, right? We have that mm-hmm. whole uh, Dr. Emoto's book with all the, right? Talking to the water and, and looking at the crystals. I mean, we are yeah. so powerful and the elements, we are stars. In fact, yeah. we're the dead stars looking back up at the skies. One of the, uh, what, I, I don't remember her name and I'm sorry I don't, but one of these like astronomer, uh, astrophysic women or something, she has a quote out that she had said that, like they asked her like, what is, what are we? What are humans? And it's like, we are dead stars. And we are, right? The iron, the, the all the elements, all the stuff that makes us up is what's fallen to the earth from, right? Like a, a starburst kind of thing. And yeah, we have this intuitive wisdom because obviously the universe does. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's a piece that people I think really just don't, like they don't get. And then sometimes moms are like, my kid won't eat anything. They won't do anything. I'm like, well... How are you making dinner? Are you frantic? Are you full of anxiety? Yeah. So this is pillar two, the secret energy of food and detoxing your kitchen. Um, And detoxing your kitchen also has to do with like, uh, I'll throw divorce in there. Normally talk about the grandma thing, but let's say you and your husband, you know, decide to get divorced Uh and you get things. Every fight you've had in that kitchen is in that pot. Mm. So I really teach people that your energy is still there. It doesn't mean you have to get rid of everything. There's certain things that we can do to clean up the energy in there, as well as who lived in your house last, you know, you know, we moved into other people's houses and the ovens and the things in the kitchen stay. So you're also reading that as well. Um, The third pillar has to do very much like what you're saying. Um, I use energy mastery work for people to really understand how their energy is clean up your energy, provide that in different ways, um, helping you become more calm, helping your kitchen change, helping the food change, helping the way your body processes food change, helping you to release that weight really fast. And then the last thing is really that, that neuroscience piece of 
I pride the fact that, yes, my mom struggled with her weight, but I didn't know it until I brought it into the Mm -hmm. picture myself from having the issues. And then I started to see it with her. But if your mom was somebody that struggled with weight from a very young age, or nowadays, I'm really waiting to see what will happen in the years that of like, the moms that post the before and afters and make their whole life on, you know, the way they look. That's a really good point. Or even what I'm seeing and I'm very concerned about is that they think they're really talking about health, but they're obsessed with the calories, the sugar grams, the this or the that. And they're speaking that into their children, you know, their children's environment. Like, I don't want you having too much sugar. But yeah. they're not really explaining what types of sugar and, and they don't even understand the differences in sugar. Like there's so much ignorance yeah. going on in the head. I, I think that will produce one, more anxiety. And two, oh, yeah, more- I see it already. I see yeah. it in my seven-year-old niece, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, that's where I pride myself on, again, as a mom, because my kids don't have any of that. Like I've heard my daughter say something like, like today we were trying to get churros for breakfast because they wanted to try this place. And I was like, sure, we can. And it was closed only on Thursdays. I was like, of course, the day we <laughs> the day, right? <laughs> okay, what are we gonna do? Because we're on our way to school, and I was like pressed for time, so I couldn't stop certain places. And in Spain, things are not fast; they're slow, right? So I was like, I guess we're gonna cross the street and go to the gas station. She's like, so I'm not gonna have that healthy of a breakfast. So I was like, not today, but you're gonna get nutrients, and it's gonna make you feel good because okay. you're gonna choose your food. And she did, and she felt good, and she had a great day at school, and all that good stuff. But um, it was what it was, right? Like you, you do that. And I, I don't give that, that to my children. And that is a piece that's important, but other things that are placed in our mind, like if you keep eating like that, you're going to turn out to look like aunt so-and-so. Oh yeah. Kid, you're like, okay, I don't really care. This ice cream tastes amazing. So I'm going to eat it. And then you learn aunt so-and-so is really obese. And the next day you get on the phone or you hear your mom talking on the phone to your other aunt about, can you believe it? She's just complaining and she's so tired and we keep telling her to do this. And if she just get up and walk and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Now you put three together in your head without having a filter to know what to filter out. So your subconscious mind is now like, okay, well, I eat the ice cream. So I'm like aunt so-and-so aunt so-and-so is lazy, overweight, doesn't want to walk, doesn't want to do these things. So when you get to be older, guess what? You live it out. And I've had so many clients come to me and be like, yes. Or like, um, you know, I I actually believe one of my cousins had the same thing. Her mom was like, I could eat like you until I turned 30. I remember her turning 30 and gaining about 15 pounds. And now she won't eat half the food that she absolutely loves just to be the 15 pounds skinnier. Because I truly believe it has nothing to do with the metabolism of her turning 30. It has to do with the pattern. The pattern's been placed in my brain. Right. That's I why believe- I hate in women's health this whole emphasis on like the now the perimenopause conversation. It was the oh, menopause. Right. Like, how, like oh. to me, I'm like, okay, the power of the word, people. Okay. There's no such thing as perimenopause. We literally have talked it into existence from basically what the real what the real problem is. We have made so much chemical warfare against our bodies, so much work. We're so stressed. We're not taking care. We haven't done all that cleanup work no, up before. Minutes to meditate. Like, of course, by 35, you feel like crap now. Of course. Of course, by yeah, 15, 18 years old, you have PCOS. Like that's that's what we have to like. It's like it's making you look over here while they're while the problem's over here. Yeah, the, the hormone thing though, it gets me too. I'm like. Let me let me go with this. OK, um, let me just play into you that there is this thing as perimenopause and menopause and it's what causes us to gain all the weight and blah, blah, blah. Let me play with you on this one. Then why are there skinny people still that go through it? Yeah, no, agreed. And I, I typically do just what you do, too. Like, I am probably going to trigger you at this. Second. <laughs> I will allow you to get upset. I will allow you to do what you need to do. Right. Um, and that's one of the biggest things, you know, like. I, there are so, when I, when I created my business, I never really knew that I would get here, but now I have this just passion to, to let people know 
that you have so much more power on your health. That's why I say it's as easy as taking off your bra because it's literally all inside of you. You don't have a to-do list. You don't, you don't need to portion control everything you eat. You don't have to calorie count it. You don't have to macro count it. You don't have to do all those things. You literally inside your body have this really cool thing that says, I should eat that. And no, I shouldn't eat that. And you may be like, I joke, but when I go to the grocery store, I feel like the food calls me. There are certain foods that's like, okay, this is your strawberries. Even when it's like under the box and I like lift up the box to get the one underneath, I can hear what I'm supposed to eat. In similarities, I can also understand what I'm not supposed to. You know, I was a, a very big meat eater. I've always been. And in June, I just got this like, you're not eating meat right now. Mm-hmm. And I you know, mm-hmm. still look at it and I buy meat for my family. I can still hear this is what they need versus not because I'm very in tune with my kids. But for me personally, it's not something I'm doing. It doesn't mean that I'll do it for life. Yeah. But right now I'm being called not to do that. I've, I've even gotten called into like fasting. I'm, I'm right what? now. I was actually called into fasting in July. I denied myself it. I probably should have. Like, yeah. you know, and then um, August, I realized, yeah, truly appreciate your conversation. I want to wrap this up a little bit because we need to go to long format for women. That's that's one. But this show is not yet quite there. Um, so uh, we've heard so much about sort of some of the things you wish you were telling your, your, your younger self and you're kind of telling your kids, which I think as as mothers is our responsibility to do. Right. Like like let's reparent ourselves by parenting through our kids, but not necessarily parent like our parents. Like, let's learn from the wisdom, not saying that they're bad people, just saying we should evolve. We should evolve with time. Um, If we were to flip that, let's say it's your daughter, your son, what are you hoping, you know, in 10 years, there were what, or even the you in the future, through your wisdom, what is she telling you? through your success, through your vision, through the changes that you're hoping to make? Well, that's a great question. So from my children's perspective, I truly, you know, to think in 10 years, they'll both be in their teenage years, which is crazy. But I truly hope that they're so in tune with their body still, that they're able to still say no to things that they know just aren't right for them at that moment. Like my son, when he just doesn't eat meat at the meal and when he, you know, pounds a pint of blueberries in two minutes, like I truly believe that's his intuition. So I certainly hope they're that way and that they can empower other children and other teenagers. Like maybe if your belly hurts, it's telling you not to eat that, you know, and helping them to understand that you know, whatever choice they're making doesn't make them a bad person to really remove the shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And I think for myself, uh, I've done a really good job of removing shame and guilt and worry around food. And I would love to have that continue to be a piece in my personal and motherhood life. Because while I've done such a great job that I can Be like, okay, I just ate three pieces of chocolate without really knowing. Okay, I'm going to go onward. Doesn't matter, you know? And and for me to laugh about it, like I want to have that peace for myself in all aspects of my life that I'm continuing to allow the shame and guilt. I was raised Catholic. So shame and guilt is deep in my blood, right? Deep, deep in my blood. And a brown one at that. So I have the extra layer of the whole, (laughs) you know. Deep, deep. <laughs> like shame and guilt. And I, I sometimes see that and I'm becoming more and more aware, especially in the morning, like when I wake up and something didn't go perfect the day or the night before, that I'm catching myself now faster in the shame and guilt in motherhood and in life and in my marriage. And I want it to be just like I laugh about the chocolate. So I'm hoping in 10 years from now, I'm not going to say hoping, I know in 10 years from now that I will be able to let that shame and guilt, you know, laugh off as well, especially because like you say, you're reparenting yourself. And if I remember my teenage years, I mean, I was at least a good teenager and so was my husband, thankfully, but I was also the third. So I got away with way more than my older sisters. So I don't exactly know, you know, right, and right. 
from the triggers like my small children are having now and how I'm being triggered. I actually thought about that yesterday too. And I was like, oh my gosh, what triggers am I going to have when they're in there? I know. And then that forgiveness for yourself too, right? That layer of grace. Again, a, a womb wisdom that I think we've sort of lost in the culture because we've kind of lost the the idea of, of there being womb wisdoms that are separate from non-womb wisdoms mm -hmm. is that idea of grace and, 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 and graces are given, you know, the definition of grace is you may not deserve it as opposed to the perfectionism that sort of was taught in the church and things like that, where like, you need to like earn it or whatever. Believe me, I, so I truly appreciate you, you know, trying to take that wisdom into the next generation, because that's the only way we're going to we're going to break these generational ties. And we may not be perfect at it, but maybe we shift enough. Maybe we do a little more or a little less ignorant, a little less sin sinning than our parents. And then the kids can keep taking it. Right. The kids can keep taking it. So I, yeah. I, I truly appreciate the work you're doing. Where can we find you if this is interesting to anyone? I'll put it on the show notes. Where's the best place to connect with you now? Yeah, I mean, I would say you can connect with me on LinkedIn. So okay. Leslie Therbis LinkedIn or Facebook is my second biggest area that I'm at, which is uh, Leslie Herbis there, but I have Fiala, my maiden name in the okay. name is. Yeah. All right. So I will put those in the show notes. So that's easy links. So definitely when you see this show, uh, there'll always be a direct link in the comments uh, to, to the to the direct show notes so that you can get everything super, super easy. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your wisdom and your time and your conversation. I had a really great time for your work in the world for being a modern day medicine woman. And for anyone listening to this, again, reach out to either me or Leslie directly. Make sure that you are thinking of some of the things, how you're owning your health, because we definitely need people, more conscious leaders, more people who are more conscious of relationship. And I got to say, although I love the 20% of millennial men that listen to me, older millennial men that listen to me. I want you to understand this. This is going to have to be taken this next season by the ladies, by the conscious ladies. You're no less of a man. We totally need you as supporters. You're our Allens to our Barbies, but it's, but, but we are going, we are going. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you next time on Owning Her Health. Thank you for listening into this episode of Owning Her Health with Dr. Lisa Holland, PT. To learn more about her personal and professional development service, visit her online at drlisahollandpt.com.